I am here today with Dr. Jaraza and our Police Commissioner Michael Harrison. Uh, thank you for joining us for another COVID update in Baltimore. Over the course of the last four weeks, uh, Baltimore's new case count has risen 471 uh, percent, which leads us to having a total of 54,906 confirmed cases of COVID uh, throughout Baltimore's uh, battle with the pandemic. Our current uh, positivity rate is at 3.1 percent, which is a 365 percent increase over the past four weeks. And while hospitalizations are up, with 85% of our ICU beds and 88% of our acute care beds utilized, new deaths are still low, uh, mostly due to our vaccination efforts. As the Delta variant continues to spread, we know uh, that vaccines are the difference between uh, life and death in our communities and for our residents. Yesterday, uh, we hit 65% of Baltimore residents over 18 having received at least one dose of vaccine, vaccine. While we are making progress, the Delta variant has made it clear that until we get everyone vaccinated, the COVID-19 virus will remain unpredictable and dangerous, uh, most importantly, to our communities. Again, we know that the increase in cases we are seeing is not unique to Baltimore, but as you heard me say uh, many, many times, my responsibility and single priority as mayor of Baltimore is to ensure the well-being of our residents. Uh, the last thing uh, that any of us want is to reenact further mandates or restrictions, but the reality is the only way to avoid this is for more people to get vaccinated, so uh, we are seeing uh, less and less cases of COVID-19. As we continue uh, to push for everyone to get vaccinated, please continue to do the right thing and wear your mask as a way uh, to maximize protection from the Delta variant and prevent possibly spreading it to others. We know uh, that we have an indoor mask mandate and that's why we're asking everyone to abide by that rule, not just for you, but for everyone around you. I've said it and I was before and I'll say it again, the pandemic isn't over. We can see that it's very clear across the country and across the world that it is not over. Uh, people will continue uh, to get sick and people will continue to die if we don't get more people vaccinated. So please take the necessary precautions to keep you and your family safe. Wear your mask, wear your mask, get vaccinated. As always, Dr. Jaraza and I will continue to follow uh, the science and allow the data to drive our decision making as we continue to closely monitor the impact of the Delta variant. For more information on walk-up sites for vaccines and vaccine registration, please visit covax.baltimorecity.gov. That's C-O-B-A-X dot baltimorecity.gov. And now we'll turn it over to our health commissioner, Dr. D. Good morning and thank you, Mayor Scott, for your continued leadership during the pandemic. Uh, to quickly review our latest case data, Baltimore City continues to see increases in some key indicators on our COVID-19 dashboard. As of yesterday, our daily new case count is approximately 74 new cases per day. As Mayor Scott mentioned, this is an increase of 471% from four weeks ago. To date, we have lost 1,132 residents to COVID. Based on current case counts and positivity, our current transmission rates still support the city's designation of an area with substantial transmission per the CDC. We are particularly concerned about increases in case counts among younger populations. Data for the past week shows the highest incidence rates of COVID-19 cases occurring among those in the 20 to 29 year old age group with the second highest incident rate among children under the age of 10. With increased hospitalizations of children due to COVID-19 being reported across the country, it remains vital that all individuals, especially parents or caretakers of children, get vaccinated as soon as possible in order to protect not only themselves, but also for, to protect our children from this disease. Turning to the city's vaccination efforts, we are pleased to report that more than 54% of all Baltimore City residents and 65% of all adult residents over the age of 18 have received at least one dose of vaccine. We would also like to acknowledge the increasing number of vaccinations occurring among African Americans. Since July 1st, we have seen a 12.2 increase in the number of African American city residents getting a first or single dose of vaccine. 
This brings us to a total of over 154,000 first or single doses among African-American city residents to date. This equates to about 48% of all first or single doses of the vaccine in the city overall being among our African-American community. This information on the breakdown of vaccines by race is also available on our vaccine dashboard. Although there has been a decline locally and nationally in the number of vaccines being administered, we are proud to note that Baltimore City progress in individuals getting vaccinated each week is consistently one of the highest in the state. Each week alongside our partners, we continue to operate dozens of vaccination clinics, including clinics being held during evening and weekend hours. Information regarding those hours and locations can be found on our social media, as well as our website, baltimorecity.gov slash be more vax, or by calling 443-984-8650. If you are unable to leave your home, you and your caretaker can also register for vaccinations at your home by calling 443-984-8650 or by registering online at covax.baltimorecity.gov. While our increasing vaccination rates are encouraging, the work of the City Health Department and its partners continue and remains particularly crucial in the face of ever-growing threats of coronavirus variants like Delta especially the threat they pose to our unvaccinated population. As a more transmissible version of the coronavirus, the risks posed by Delta are much greater in areas of the city with lower vaccination coverage, especially for that unvaccinated population. We continue to see the vast majority of COVID-19 hospitalizations in the state and in the country remain among unvaccinated patients. Earlier this week, acknowledging reports of lower vaccine effectiveness over time, the CDC announced that it would recommend the administration of booster doses for both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. This recommendation is still subject to the Food and Drug Administration conducting an independent evaluation and determination of the safety and effectiveness of a third dose. With this announcement, the Health Department will be prepared to administer booster doses for the general population in alignment with CDC and Maryland Department of Health guidelines starting the week of September 20th. Currently, the recommendation is for booster doses of the mRNA vaccines to be administered at least eight months after completion of their two-dose vaccination series. Keeping this in mind, boosters will be rolled out first to individuals that were prioritized for vaccination at the earliest phase of the city's vaccine campaign. This includes healthcare workers, first responders, and individuals working in public safety, among others. In preparation for this, the Health Department is in the process of planning both a semi-permanent location for booster doses, as well as setting up vaccine access points in low vaccination coverage areas to provide those booster doses. The CDC also acknowledged that booster shots will likely be necessary for those who have received Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccination as well, and have indicated more information regarding those announcements in coming weeks. As your local health department, we will communicate updates as more information comes from the CDC. We are proud of our work supporting vaccination efforts across the city, and I remain in awe of the tireless efforts of our staff and our clinical and community partners who work every day providing services to the residents here in Baltimore City. The presence of the coronavirus variant serves as a reminder to not put off the decision to get vaccinated any longer. The vaccines are safe and effective, if you are vaccinated and still get COVID, being vaccinated significantly reduces your chance of severe illness, hospitalization, and death, even for the Delta variant. So please continue to wear your mask indoors, wash your hands, be mindful of your distance, and encourage friends, family, and loved ones to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jaraza, and thank you for your leadership in through guiding us through uh, this troubling time. Uh, before we take questions, I also want to direct a resident's attention again. Uh, we spoke to you guys about this a few weeks ago about some of our city services that we have restored. We know that many of our services were impacted during the pandemic, uh, but under my leadership, city government is working toward the full restoration of resident facing services, but we will do that in a safe way, considering uh, that we are still in a pandemic. Residents can visit www.baltimorecity.gov slash service status. That's baltimorecity.gov slash service status to find a comprehensive list 
of services and their respective statuses. We will keep this site updated so residents can expect accurate, up-to-date information on a daily basis. As they have throughout the pandemic, the majority of city services uh, can be accessed online or over the phone, and residents are strongly encouraged to continue accessing city services online. I want to thank every one of our employees who have continued to deliver those essential services to our residents, those who have came back and allowed us to open the front facing services to the public. Without each and every one of our workers, this pandemic would have been even tougher for our residents and folks who open businesses and are trying to open businesses in Baltimore uh, to bear. We wanna thank our city employees from the depth of our hearts. So thank you, and now we'll take a few questions. Jane? that she had recommended that uh, the city mandate vaccines for city employees as they return. What, what is your thinking on that and have you made a decision about that? No, actually the, the health commission I met yesterday after uh, her hearing uh, discussing that, Jane, discussing booster shots and everything COVID related. Uh, we're uh, currently exploring several uh, strategies to promote vaccinations and get people vaccinated. That is one of them. Uh, decision will be coming from me uh, as, as everything uh, from not just the health commissioner, but from all of our city agencies, from the city administrator is being put into a final decision uh, for me to make. And I will make that decision in the coming, in the coming days and weeks. And just to follow up, do you have a current count I think the health commissioner said yesterday that among city school teachers, I believe you said the 80% level of vaccination, um, obviously that's not your agency, but do you have a count of city employees and their vaccination levels per agency? Dr. D? Yeah, so, so DHR has conducted a survey, so it, it is based on self-reporting. Um, so DHR does hold that data. Um, I think it's about 60% of employees are thought to be vaccinated. Again, this is based on self-report. Um, so I would say DHR is probably the best data source. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Ma'am? Can you talk a little bit more about how you plan to roll out the COVID booster shots? I know the governor said yesterday that he didn't um, plan on reopening the mass vaccination sites. So how do you plan to make that as smooth as possible for city residents? Yeah, I'll let Dr. D answer that question, but we know uh, as she said, we will be looking at having sites again as we had before, but also uh, continuing the great work that we've done to be able to make uh, the vaccine accessible in communities. So, I mean, we currently run about 20 to 25 vaccination sites per week alongside our clinical partners. Um, and we do believe that those could take on additional capacity um, once boosters are available. Um, as I mentioned, we are looking also for more of a semi-permanent site. So many of our vaccination clinics, of course, um, may vary um, and then come back uh, for later to provide doses. Um, so we are looking at establishing a semi-permanent location, but, but we already have, like I said, about 20 to 25 clinics that run each week providing doses now. Great, thank you. Emily? Good morning. Um, are there any updates about the plans to do the vaccine incentive program for city employees? And then also um, about the plans to build a permanent location for the booster shot clinic. Have you guys identified a site? So again, let me first say that uh, the individual that said that we were planning to do that spoke out of turn and that will be de dealt with accordingly. Uh, we are considering, considering many options, including uh, to include, but no decision has been sent to me. Nothing is on my desk, nothing is final. And anyone else that told you anything else doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, so we will be looking at many ways, as you've heard us say, about how to increase vaccination amongst our employees. Uh, many things are on the table. We will discuss and take the best appropriate action. And I think, uh, Dr. D, uh, I guess if you can just restate what you said about the vaccine. Uh, sure, shot. just regarding yeah. the plans to build a permanent booster shot clinic, if you've identified a site. So again, it may not necessarily be building. Um, you know, again, m much of our sites, I think the advantage is that they're mobile in nature, so they're easily transported. Um, we would be looking for more of a semi-permanent location. So previously, when we had our mass vaccination sites, um, we, we did a lot of groundwork and research to understand the capacity of those sites. So I think it's, it's just a matter of, of narrowing down and selecting, but we've already done much of that research already. Thank you. Emily, just to, to add to what Dr. D is saying, I think it's important to note the data that she gave today about the uh, an amount of African-Americans who are vaccinated in the city, a lot of that work was done after 
the mass vac sites because we know the transportation access and the other things that we have. Taking it to uh, the individuals and residents has made it more accessible and uh, working with our community partners to break down the barriers is how we got to this point. Um, regarding the discussions that are happening around mandating vaccines for employees, um, I've heard from at least one of the city unions, the fire officers union, that said they would oppose this and they believe this needs to be bargained. Is that, what is your understanding of whether this would need to be bargained with the various unions? Well, these are part of the discussions that we're having, Emily. Uh, we don't believe that it has to be bargained. Uh, we're always going to work with our partners in labor. Uh, we're going to be having those discussions uh, as we move towards making a decision. And I believe it, I don't believe it's the fire officers, I think it's the fire union. I think it's reversed, but yeah. I know it's confusing, <laughs> there's two of them. Ma'am? Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I have an off topic question. Um, given what we know right now, there's a lawsuit pending, uh, potentially getting filed against the school district. We know that city councilman Robert Stokes has called a second hearing to bring the CEO back, but it's not until September, which after the middle of September after school starts. Do you think that's long enough or should the city have to wait that long to get answers? And have you had any more communication with the CEO about the state of schools? Well, I think, listen, the council schedules with their business on council terms. I'm not a legislator anymore. I don't determine what happens there. I think for me, uh, what I am focused on when you talk about our school children is one, getting them registered and making sure that they're returning back to school so that they can learn in person, which is also why we need adults to get vaccinated because we know in Baltimore City that we need our young people learning in school, in person, uh, because of the things that they would have to face in order to continue to learn at home. Uh, you cannot, many of them cannot learn at home, even when they don't have internet barrier access because there are things that prevent them in their environment from learning there. We have to understand that educating our young people is important. This is not for me. Again, this is not something that is just going to be a hot topic or a topic on a, a nightly news or, uh, for folks to discuss. We have to make sure that our system is continuing to grow. Uh, I don't comment on open lawsuits, as you know. That's not something I'm going to do. But I, what I will do for folks is to say, for everybody that wants to complain about what's going on in our schools, when's the last time you volunteered in the school? When's the last time you actually mentored a young person through reading partners, helping our young people get on a higher level of reading? When the last time you went in and said, I want to work with this young person on a tutoring to help them because their parent is working two and three jobs and they don't have time to do it? All of us have more to do to help our young people learn. But the most important thing right now is that we get them back into school so that as we are moving into the time, we're finally, after this state of Maryland admitted that it's been underfunding our schools for $300 million a year, finally we're now moving to the time where we're going to actually have them be funded and we'll build in the accountability and make sure they're learning in a 21st century environment. And also, we know that we need to get them back in school because uh, this should be the headline, in my opinion. We're opening five brand new school buildings in Baltimore City as we go back to school, a system that went most of my life without opening a new school or renovating one. This, is the, this will make over 25 schools that we've done over the last few years to put an opportunity for young people to learn because you cannot. I've had to do it. You cannot learn in a school building when it doesn't have heat. You cannot properly learn in a school building when it doesn't have air. You cannot learn if you don't have the other materials down to textbooks that other people have. That is also an issue that we need to address. Thank just you. A, just a quick follow-up on that. I know you said you're not a, a legislator, you're not involved in city council, but you are the mayor. Your voice carries a lot of weight in this discussion. Should they be acting quicker with more urgency? No, the reality is this. I don't, tell, I don't tell you how to be a reporter. I'm not going to tell the council how to do their job. Uh, they schedule their hearings on their time, not mine, just like I schedule my meetings on my time, not theirs. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the commissioner a question? Uh, we've seen uh, these two 15-year-olds shot recently, the 15-year-old um, just arrested. Um, what, what can be done about all of this juvenile crime, both victims and the suspects? I'll take it first. First and foremost, this is, again, another point of what we know. This is why when you hear me talk about the comprehensive approach, 
Young people aren't born this way. Uh, their society leads them to be this way. Missed opportunity leads them to be this way. Missed interventions lead them to be this way. This is why you hear us and in my comprehensive violence reduction plan talk about diversion for young people that go astray early so we prevent these things from happening. Opportunities for them and their families, but also about accountability uh, for everyone, right? We have to understand that this young lady that was murdered, this happened at like one o'clock in the morning. A 15 year old shouldn't be outside. We have to talk about our responsibility as adults and people who are out there that allow these things to happen. This is not just about juvenile crime. This is about our young people and treating them in the way that we should, holding them accountable uh, as we should in any time that they're committing violence, but also understanding how society has pushed uh, many of our young people because we've been missing and we have to intercede in that as well. Well, I don't think I could have answered that any better. The mayor, the mayor touched on it all. It, but it really is about making sure that as we work to prevent crime, we're working with all of our stakeholders and families, schools, churches, neighborhood, community groups are all stakeholders. What we can all do collectively to make sure young people, number one, change their thinking about why they're doing that and help them have a, a pathway away and alternatives so that they don't have to make that bad decision. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.